sixth week of our study of John. And we're almost, yeah, I think the last year was when we started this thing. And uh, so, yeah, 26 weeks in, uh, in, in the book of John. So we're in John chapter 10, starting today, starting a new chapter. But uh, even though it is a new chapter... We're continuing off of chapter 9, the story that happened in chapter 9. And we know the story that happens in chapter chapter 9. Jesus has done an incredible thing where he's healed a blind man that had been blind from birth. He wasn't allowed to come into the the temple to worship. He wasn't allowed to go in and worship with other people. And when Jesus heals him, what happens is they kick the man out of the temple. The religious leaders do. And, And... I don't know what it is about me, and I, and I know each one of us, I mean, we could all testify to having the ability to have a, a Pharisee kind of hypocritical way about us, right? I mean, we all have that inside of us, because we all nitpick at everybody else's sin, and while our sin is glaring in front of us, and, and we want to say everybody else is bad, and we're not so bad, and when people go to stone us, we want them to use little stones, and when we go to stone other people... We get the giant boulders and throw at people. Jesus so many times has those moments with these Pharisees where he calls them out on who they are and what they are. And in John chapter 10, that's no different. Jesus is going to take it up a whole nother level because John does something incredible. John doesn't really talk a lot about God's, Jesus' miracles. He doesn't really talk much about his teachings. But in from now until through the rest of John, which is 20-some chapters, we're going to see Jesus do a whole lot of teaching with his disciples. But this is the last time that you're really going to see Jesus do, this, this week and next week, you're going to really see Jesus do a lot of teaching that he does and point out the Pharisees' hypocrisy and, uh, and put them in their place. And so, if you've ever been hurt by the church or by somebody in the church, this is one of those that you need to hear. Okay? Have you ever been damaged by somebody in the church? Somebody that claimed the name of Jesus? This is the message for you. John chapter 10. I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep recognize his voice, and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. And they follow behind him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Verse 6 says that those who heard Jesus use this illustration, they didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them even, even more. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pasture. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as my father who knows me, and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life. So I take 
So I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want and to also take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinion about him. Some said, he's demon-possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? But others said, this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon at all. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning and for what you're going to do for us this morning. (laughs) Separating us and letting us see how we are under the care of the good shepherd. We ask Jesus that you would make your word come alive to us as we read it and we study it this morning. And that it wouldn't just be something that just kind of rolls off of us, but it would just penetrate into us and that it would, it would divide whatever the enemy's trying to do. I ask God that it would, just, it would just fall off. Whatever Satan's plan and goal is this morning to divide, to destroy, to make the words not effective, I ask Jesus that you would block that right now and use me by the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver your words flawlessly like a surgeon that would go in to do heart surgery on us this morning. In Jesus' powerful name, I pray. Amen. There was a shepherd that was herding his flock in a remote pasture when suddenly this brand new Chevy Tahoe advanced towards him out of a huge dust cloud. And the driver was a young man in an Armani suit, Gucci shoes, Ray-Ban sunglasses, designer tie. He leans out the window and he asks, Hey, shepherd, if I can tell you exactly how many sheep you have in your flock, will you give me one? The shepherd leans on his staff and he looked at the man and then at his peaceful grazing flock and answered, Sure. So the city slicker parks his, his... Tahoe whips out an iPad, connects it to his cell phone, surfs through a NASA database website where he calls up some GPS navigational system. He scans the area, opens up the database and and, and some 60 spreadsheets that are complex formulas. He finally prints out a 150-page report on on a miniature printer, and he turns to the shepherd and he says, you have exactly 1,586 sheep in your flock. That's not bad. That is correct. And as I agreed, you can take one of the sheep, says the shepherd. So he watched as the young man makes his selection. He bundles it into the Tahoe in the back of his vehicle and starts to pull away. He calls out. The shepherd says, if I can tell you exactly what business it is that you are in, will you give me my sheep back? Sure. Sure. Why not, says the young man. You are an executive government assistant consultant, aren't you? The man's jaw drops, and he says, that's right. How did you know that? He says, it's easy. You turned up here without being asked. You want to be paid for information that I already have, and you don't know anything about my business because you just took my dog and not one of my sheep. In our study of John chapter 9, we saw Jesus really butt heads with the religious leaders of Judaism. Jesus heals this man that is born blind and and then disappears. And when the man is grilled and confronted by the religious leaders and says good things about Jesus, they end up kicking him out of the community of faith. They even exile him and say, you're not allowed, you're not welcome in this community anymore. We're going to put you out on the edges and you might as well be dead. But Jesus finds this man again, thank God, by the end of chapter 9. And Jesus comes up to him as he's being thrown out of the temple. And these religious leaders who claim that they can see, Jesus reveals to them that they're actually the ones that are blind. And the ones who claim that they cannot see are the ones that can actually see. We have this same continuation in chapter 10. Remember, the chapters and verses really are not important. It goes flows straight through chapter 10. 
Chapter 10, Jesus is continuing to teach about the miracle that that we've just witnessed and how Jesus views these so-called shepherds. That's what the Pharisees called themselves. They were the shepherds of the people of Jerusalem. They they were self-proclaimed, made themselves higher than everyone else. When they would walk in public, they wanted everybody else to to kind of bow and to like, oh, oh, he's here. And, and when I walk into places and Heather Bissett does that, it drives me nuts. Uh, when she's like, Reverend! And I'm like, don't, don't do that, Heather. Or she'll say, Father Smith, or something very profound and just totally embarrasses me, like you saw last week with the shark costume thing. This week on uh, social media, I posted the 60-second sermon, is what I try to call them about those who have been hurt by the church using John chapter 10 as an example. Jesus uses this sheep and the shepherd as an example as he calls out and condemns those of the Jewish leadership for the damage that they have done in the name of God. Now I know this, we could all go around the room this morning and and as examples, we could give you, every single one of us could tell of a time where someone in the name of Christ, in the name of Jesus, or in the name of the church or whatever, has has done damage to us. Every single one of us have those stories of of times when there were people that were so-called Christians have damaged us, have said things to us, have hurt us, have made us feel like the the splinter in our eye is a two-by-four sticking out of our head. And in fact, the world is full of those people that have turned their back on church, that have turned their back on Jesus forever because they have been damaged by people who claim to be followers of Jesus. And it it really gets under my skin because I know that that is not Jesus. That is not Him. He does not do damage when he comes into someone's life. He does not leave them beaten and bruised. He is the one that comes along, he picks them up and puts them on his donkey and takes them to town and says, hey, I want you to take care of them and anything that that you need when I come back, I will take care of that. That's what our Jesus does. He does not leave people beaten, damaged, and bruised and abuse them. He doesn't. And if that's the Jesus that you think that he is, then maybe you should find another place to worship because that won't happen here. It doesn't. It does not happen in the body of Christ. You have missed, you're following a different Jesus than I know. The Jesus that I know, when he comes into people's lives, he radically changes them and they are forever changed. And when they are changed, they are not beaten down. They are lifted up. They are encouraged. No one has ever been hurt more by the church than Jesus. No one has ever been hurt more by the church than Jesus himself. But guess what? He still shows up every Sunday. No one's been more damaged than him but he doesn't give up. In our scripture today, Jesus is giving two parable style analogies and illustrations to what it it means to be a good shepherd versus being a bad shepherd. I I remember when we did our our, uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd sermon series. Man, that was one of those, I I was preaching to myself. you, You got something out of it, that's great, but I was preaching to me. And, and as I was studying, I went back and actually looked at the notes because the title of that sermon series was The Good Shepherd. And Jesus says twice in our scripture today, I am the good shepherd. And it reminded me of what David says about him. And in, in the Psalm 23, he, David, he, he speaks from, even though he was a shepherd, he speaks from the perspective of the sheep, how the sheep views the shepherd. And in one point, when he gets to the point where he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of a death, 
he stops talking to us about the shepherd and he starts to talk to the shepherd. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. So as David is speaking from this viewpoint, he reminds us that sheep are helpless. They need a shepherd. David is bragging, to, uh, bragging that the Lord is his shepherd. There's no other shepherd that he has. The Lord is it. And it is his shepherd that provides for everything that he needs. Clean water. When all of the other sheep come around and start to stomp in the mud and make muddy puddles so that the other sheep can't drink, the shepherd, he says, no, that's not going to happen. I'm going to lead you to clean, fresh drinking water. And it's going to be calm because I know how you are. Just like We're just like sheep. We get riled up sometimes. Sometimes we, we even get in those moments where we doubt, where we fear, where we have those, those insecurities. The shepherd understands that. He, he frees us, those of us that are fence crawlers, the ones that go around the edge of the fence of the shepherd's fold, and we're like, oh, that grass really looks green over there. Us fence crawlers, he loves us too. I'm one of those fence crawlers. He loves, he loves to free us from the pests. He loves to, he, he, he forces us to rest. Oh, man. He forces us to rest. Because he realizes that sheep that don't rest, when we don't rest, what happens to us? We become so obsessed by the things that are going on all around us, we forget to rest sometimes. And so he forces us to lie down and rest in those green pastures. The shepherd leads us and we follow. He doesn't drag us. I'm my dog when I take him places on a leash. I pretty much have to drag him places as he just kind of lays there and I have to drag him. Jesus doesn't do that with his sheep. He leads and we follow. For those that are the bummer lambs in the room, the ones that have been abused and have been beaten up by the other sheep, Yes, sheep are bullies, especially to each other. And you want to know what the sheep do to each other sometimes? They'll butt heads with other sheep. Not butt head. you see what I'm saying? No. They will butt their heads with other sheep. And so you know what the shepherd will do sometimes? He will take salve, a grease formula, and he will put it on their heads. So when they do butt heads, they slide right off and no damage is done. He anoints our head with oil that fights off the bugs that will get into our brain and drive us mad. And for those that want to wander, those that want to walk away from the shepherd, it's been told before that it was what would happen is that the, uh, the shepherd would, when a sheep would start to wander off, a, a shepherd would grab that sheep and he would take the sheep's leg and he would snap the leg over his leg so that that sheep couldn't wander off anymore and it was called breaking the legs but we have been given a misinterpretation of what that is you know that there's two different ways to spell break correct right break like on your car they slow things down to break a leg is not the same thing what the shepherd actually does is he puts he puts a a, a, a thing attached to the sheep's leg. It's called a sheep break. And what happens is that shepherd, he wants to make sure that the sheep can't just run off. Because he knows when that sheep runs off, he's going into danger. He doesn't know where he's going. The, she the sheep are stupid. They have no clue what's going on. They don't understand danger is there. And so the shepherd doesn't break the legs of the sheep. He puts a break on the legs of the sheep so they can't get away from him. And you know what he does to those that have been hurt when he finds them? Those cast sheep, when cast sheep are cast, they're upside down. They can't move. They can't get back over by themselves, so he'll turn them back over so that their digestion, they don't die. Because if, if he leaves them there, they'll die. For those of us that get on our backs and we can't move for ourselves, he picks us back up. He takes his time because the, the gases have built up in the sheep and 
there has to be this moment where he gives the gases a relief because if he does it too quick, those sheep will die. And he will, he will pet them gently and he will say, why do you keep running off? Why do you keep running off? When are you going to learn? That's what our shepherd does. That's what our good shepherd does. In our scripture today, Jesus calls out the evil, self-proclaimed shepherds of Israel. And he does it with two stories. The first part, he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the shepherd fold, of the sheep fold, rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Now, for us to understand what Jesus is trying to say, we have to understand the, the concept of what's happening in this, in this culture. In the culture, you would have a, a little village, okay? Let's pretend that Kurt and, and Steve, they kind of live close together, and the Mowers are kind of there too, and you guys have, let's say you all have sheep. And what you would do is at night, you would come in and you would put all of your sheep, all of them, into one pen. Even though they belong to different families, they would all have be in one pen at night. Well, the shepherd would go and sleep and there would be a, a watchman that would stay at the gate to make sure that no predators would get in, no thieves would get in. And so in the morning, when the shepherd would wake up and it's time to take his sheep out for the day, the shepherd would walk to the pen, and when he would walk to the pen... It was only that the gatekeeper would open the gate for the shepherd. If anybody else comes, they're not allowed in the sheep pen. Now you say, well, Kurt's got his sheep, and Steve's got his sheep, and, 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 and Mr. Maurer back there, the president of, Ke of Kellogg'sville, has his sheep. How do they, all those sheep, they're all mixed together for the night. How in the world are they going to know which sheep are which sheep? Simple. The shepherd knows. Now, he doesn't go in and go, well, well, you're my sheep, and you're my sheep, and you're my sheep. What he does is he goes to the, the edge of the gate, and he calls them. Now, shepherds are great because they have their own little language that they use. And in fact, a really good shepherd, he can train his sheep as he calls them by name, and they will respond. And so what the shepherd will do is he'll make a little noise. Sometimes he'll... He'll whistle, sometimes he'll make a little tune, but they all have this keen sense that when the they hear their shepherd, they all flock to him. They come out from all the other sheep, and they go with their shepherd. The, the sheep have this, this relationship with their shepherd that, that they know his, the sound of his voice. And in fact, if you would have someone that would come and try to mimic that sound, they know so, they're, they're so good because they know the different sounds their shepherd makes. They can tell the inflection in the tone of his voice. And when he calls their name or when he says what he says to get them all to go, they go right to him. You know, the beautiful part is we talked about bummer lambs before. Bummer lambs are the ones that are, the mom doesn't want to have anything to do with them. And at birth, they will die if not for the shepherd to, take, to intervene. And what the shepherd will do is, that shepherd will take that little lamb into his house, he'll put it by the fire, he'll feed it with a bottle till it gets strong enough, he'll, he'll teach it to listen to the voice. In fact, at nighttime, he will lay down with the sheep. While that sheep sleeps, the shepherd sleeps. And you'll notice the bummer lambs, when, when the shepherd walks out to the pen, when he walks out to the gate, Sometimes the bummer lambs don't even have to be called because they want to be so close to their shepherd. Now get this. They, they will beat all of the other sheep to get close to the shepherd. Why? It's not because they're loved more. It's because they know it. They know their shepherd loves them. It says, after he has gathered his own flock, verse 4, he walks ahead of them, and they follow behind him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from a stranger. How many times, how many times have we listened to the wrong voice because we've not been close enough to the shepherd to understand what he sounds like? 
It's kind of like, it's kind of like a, Addie has headphones that she listens to music on in her bedroom. And we'll be calling her from like the garage or the kitchen or something. And she says, Addie, you won't hear anything. Because usually she's like, yes, Father, or something. She talks like that. Like a good pastor's kid would be. And we'll just, Addie! And you're calling her out her name, and she's just like, she's not coming. And I look at Andrea, and I said, she's got those stupid headphones on, doesn't she? That's exactly what it is. She's got her headphones on, and she can't hear my voice. How many times do we let the things that are in our world block the voice of our shepherd when he's calling our name saying don't wander off stay close to me but we don't hear it because we got other things that are going all around us and we don't hear the shepherd's voice he leads them he does not drive them butchers drive the sheep shepherds lead the sheep driving sheep in fact will scatter them will make them scatter there's a true story of Uh, While in the Middle East, there was a man that came across a shepherd, and he started a conversation with him about sheep listening to the voice of their shepherd. So the man said to the shepherd, let me swap clothes with you. We We will switch clothes, and I will go out as I am their shepherd, and you can have street clothes on, and I'll be, I'll look like you, smell like you, and I'll call the sheep to see if those sheep will come along. So the man changed clothes with the shepherd even walked in between the sheep, around the sheep, so that they could kind of get the smell. They think, oh, that's my shepherd. So the, the shepherd begins to walk off, and he's, he, he thinks, I got them, I got them. Those sheep are going to follow me because they think I, I'm their shepherd. They, I smell like their shepherd. I look like the, the shepherd. So the shepherd that was dressed in street clothes walked the opposite direction. And those little sheep, he didn't say anything, not a word, until he gets about 100 feet away, and he makes the sound. And when he does, those sheep take off, not towards the man who looked like the shepherd, but to the man who was calling them. Because the sheep only know the voice of their shepherd. Jesus says, They won't follow a stranger. They'll actually run from a stranger because they don't know his voice. Verse 6 tells us that the the religious leaders, they're getting irritated with Jesus right here. They said that we don't understand. What are you trying to... That doesn't make any sense to us. You see, Jesus uses the analogy of a shepherd because they hated real shepherds in their time. They would not let shepherds into the temple because the shepherds were seen as unclean people. Jesus picked the job that nobody wanted to pick. And he says, I am, that's me, I'm the good shepherd. And when he says that, they, they really take offense to that. So Jesus goes on, because they, they said, we don't understand what you're trying to say. So Jesus says, in, in, in verse 7, he says, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true shepherd did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely, will find good pasture. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give life, to give them a rich, satisfying, full life. So Jesus uses another analogy, and this is what he uses. The picture of a sheepfold. Josh, you got the picture for us? Now, when shepherds would lead their flock out in the wilderness, this is away from home, when they're, they're traveling for days and days to find food, away from home, there would be these little things set up all around the countryside, all over, and shepherds would share them. They would leave them. They wouldn't tear them down. They would leave them. When the ne- next shepherd would come along with his sheep, they would use another sheepfold, this, this pen, if you want to call it, out in the wilderness, And at nighttime, when the sheep would get tired from walking all day and the shepherd's ready to rest and he wants to put them down because if sheep don't rest, they do not digest their food. When they don't digest their food, they don't get the nourishment that they need. That's why the shepherd makes them lie down. So the shepherd will take his sheep into this pen. Go to the next picture, Josh. 
And, and you'll see that in this pen, this is an old, super old one. I think it's in Ireland somewhere. And the, the shepherd, will he will stand at the door. You see, there's no gate. There's no, no lock on the door. There's nothing like that. The shepherd will stand there with his, with his rod. And as each one of the sheep walks in, they will pass under that rod. And what the shepherd will do is he'll check to make sure that each one of his sheep, they don't have any parasites, they don't have any issues, they're not lame or hurt. He checks them over very thoroughly, and as soon as they go through under that rod of protection, the shepherd has checked each one of these sheep off, and he knows them. He knows each one of them. Until they're all in this pen. Until they're all in the sheepfold. But Jesus says something, something kind of weird there. He says, I am the gate. There was a 19th century biblical scholar who was traveling throughout the Holy Land one day and he came across a shepherd and his sheep and they started a conversation and the man showed him the sheepfold that would look something like this into which the sheep were led at night and, and it consisted of four walls or kind of a circular shape and the Bible scholar he says to this man he says this is, is this where the sheep go at night and the shepherd said yes this is where I take them and when they are inside here, they are perfectly safe. But the, the, the biblical scholar says, well, there's no door. How do you keep them in? How do you keep them safe? And the shepherd replied to him the exact words, I am the door. Now, now this man was not a Christian. He did not know the biblical truth thing that we're talking about. He did not know the scriptures that we're talking about today. That shepherd said to the man, I am the door. He says, when the light has gone and all of the sheep are inside, he says, I lay down in front of the opening of the door. He says, and not one sheep will cross over my body without me knowing about it. No predator will come in without me knowing, unless they cross my body. Jesus told him, he says, I am the gate. This is important for us right here because it is not by our works that we get into the kingdom. <laughs> it is only through the gate that we get in. You cannot earn your way into the, his sheepfold. It is only by going through him that we are able to get into the kingdom. Jesus is pointing out to them the difference between a good shepherd and a bad one. He says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will, listen to this, they will come and go freely and will find good pasture. Meaning that we find true freedom in Christ to live our lives in relationship with our shepherd. If you are living outside of that, you are, you're missing out on a good, good shepherd that wants, to, that wants the best for you. It's that we find freedom and forgiveness only in Jesus, not by what others think of us, not by what others say we are, good or bad, but by what our shepherd says about us. And this is the problem, that people in the church, become, they become the judge and the jury for people. And they begin to tell them where they have failed and where they have messed up instead of allowing the shepherd to be the one that shepherds the sheep. Jesus, Jesus is, is, is livid when he's talking about this because he just witnessed a group of religious people kick a man out of church that had been born blind his very first day he could have ever gone into the temple, they kick him out of the temple. Why? Because they thought he wasn't good enough. And Jesus says, you don't understand how that works. Obviously, this is not an exclusive club for the perfect. This is a place where people that are damaged and, and messed up find true hope and forgiveness. It is not a place where you can put your little things up on a shelf and say, look at the things that I've done in my life and God loves me because of those things. No. It's a hospital for the broken, not a museum for the perfect. 
And Jesus says, the only way that you're going to get in here is through me. And he doesn't kick sheep out. You don't get in by doing good stuff, and you don't get kicked out by doing bad stuff. Jesus says, I want all the sheep to be here. Jesus, in verse 10, he says, the thief's person, for, for purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Guess what he's doing? He is pointing at them, those religious leaders, and he says, that's your purpose, is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. My, my heart's cry is this. If you have been hurt, if you have been hurt by people in the name of Jesus, it was not him that did that. His purpose is to give you life and abundant life, not to tear you down. Verse 11, he, break, he, he, he makes them even more mad. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd, shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And they knew when he said that I'm the good shepherd, he was calling himself God because all through the Old Testament, God is known as the good shepherd. And Jesus is saying, I'm the good shepherd. Now look at this, verse 12. Jesus says, a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because... They don't belong to him. And he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and they scatter and scatters the flock. The hired hand will run away because he's not he's working only for the money. We know people like that, don't we? They're only in it for what can benefit them, what they get out of it. Their pride becomes the thing that they love the most. And so when things get tough, they bail. Shepherd doesn't do that. That's not the shepherd. There was a true story of a couple that were visiting Madrid, Spain, on a on visit to one of the, the villages south of Madrid. The couple walked into a, a local bar, a cafe, and it turned out that the owner of some of the sheep were in an argument with some other people in the bar that night. And, and what turns out is there was a party in the village that night. And the people that were hired to watch the sheep, that were the hired hands, the helpers, instead of watching the sheep, they went to the party. And they let the sheep roam. And so the sheep were found on the other side of the village, on the other side of town, all by themselves, going door to door, butting their heads against the door, trying to find their shepherd all night long. And the shepherd is just reaming these guys out because they were supposed to be the ones watching the sheep, and they failed at their job. For those of you that have been hurt by the church, by people that they, they were claiming the name of Christ, let me tell you again, this, that it was not Jesus that did that. That was not your good shepherd. Those were hired hands, and God will deal with them. God will deal with them. They are going to have to face what they've done. When they stand before God, they're going to have to, they're going to, have to own up to what they've done. And the shepherd will call them out for what they have done to you. Your shepherd loves you. He cares about you. He chases you. He lays his life down for you. Don't listen to the voices that are all around that would say that, that he does not care and does not love you. Because he loves you beyond measure. In fact, he is willing to put himself in the place of you for you to have freedom and forgiveness. Verse 14, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. I don't just know them, they know me. 
just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Now this is the part I love, verse 16. I have other sheep too. <laughs> he wasn't just talking about the Jews. He's talking about us, Gentiles that aren't Jewish. That's good news for you and me. That's us right there. Okay, verse 16, that's us. The other sheep, we're the other sheep. Probably the black sheep. <clears throat> that's us. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them in also. They will listen to my voice. And there will be, listen, there will be one flock and one shepherd. If anybody's trying to convince you that there's supposed to be another shepherd and another flock, no. There's one. There's one. Jesus Christ. The only shepherd that there is. Nobody else. Verse 17, he says, The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life, so I take it back again. He's talking about resurrection. He's giving them a preview of what's going to happen. He says, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it. I voluntarily lay it down. You think Pilate had anything to do with Jesus dying? No, absolutely not. Jesus laid his own life down. I'm making myself available for you, is what he is saying. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want and also take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. My question for you today is this. What shepherd is leading you? See, we all have shepherds in our lives that lead us places. And my question to you is this. What, what shepherd is leading you where? How are you following Jesus' voice and staying close to him? And what needs to change in your life for you to be able to hear him more clearly? Because the things in this world, they will bog us down. They will, they will get in the way of us hearing our shepherd. What needs to change in your life so that you can hear the shepherd better? Number one, I think, is if you've been damaged and hurt by people and you're holding on to that, you need to let that go and forgive those people and move on. The thing I love about sheep they forget all the time. They forget constantly. We need to forget those people that have damaged us in the past and have done, th done things to us and let it go. Because we have a great shepherd. Why would you care about the bad shepherd? Why would you care about the bad things in life when you have such a great shepherd who lays his life down for you, who is the door, who is the gatekeeper, who's the one who's going to let you in? Forget about all those other people. Forget about all those other things. What needs to change in your life so that you hear the voice of your, sh your shepherd better? And the last thing is, are you hindering other people from hearing the good shepherd's voice? My hope and my prayer is that at this church, there would not be anybody that would hinder people from hearing the Good Shepherd. Is there unbelief in your life? And if there is, what do you need to do to get rid of it? Our Good Shepherd says to us, I don't turn anybody away. I want them all to come in. So what shepherd are you listening to? You listening to the voices of the past, the things in the past? Or are you listening to your good shepherd? I'm going to pray. And when I pray this morning, if you have business that you need to do with God, the altars are open. This is an opportunity for you. You can do it at your seat. You can do it here at the altars. You can do whatever you need to. But this is a moment for you to connect with your shepherd. Because your shepherd has been calling your name. He's calling your name. And all you need to do is just listen and turn around and follow him and let him lead you and guide you. Father, we know that you are the good shepherd. <clears throat> you are not a... You're not one that will lead us places that are bad for us. You are not the voice that calls out and, 
and condemns us. No, you're the shepherd that comes after us even when we've gotten ourselves into the situations we've gotten ourselves into. You're the good shepherd that will lay his life down for us dumb sheep. And you don't ask for anything in return. That's the beautiful thing about it. There's no strings attached. You as a good shepherd come along and say, I need you to listen to my voice so that I can direct you where you need to be, where you will find good, clean drinking water, where you will find the nourishment you need, where you will have the safety that you need, and that the enemy cannot get to you as long as I, the good shepherd, am around. Help us, Jesus. I want to be like one of those bummer lambs that gets so close to you that you're tripping over me. <laughs> I want you to trip over me, Jesus, because that's how close I want to be to you. Because every other voice that is going on all around me is always trying to pull me in a different direction. I need to be face-to-face. -face. I need to be in relationship with my shepherd. I want to be the head of the flock. I want to be the one that knows he's the most lost, that knows he's the one that needs the shepherd the most. And I'm so thankful that you chased me down when you did. And you brought me back and you didn't hold it against me. You said, you are free, forever free. Jesus, I feel like that there are people in this room this morning that have been held down and held back and damaged by other people. And they've, they thought it was the good shepherd, but it wasn't the good shepherd. The good shepherd is good for a reason. And he has relationship with his sheep. Father, we, we ask this morning that you would help us to stop hindering other people from hearing the good shepherd's voice. I know sometimes that there have been moments where I have hindered other people hearing from the good shepherd. Don't let me be one of those people. Don't let us be a church that hinders people from getting closer to you. Help us to understand that we are in the sheepfold as well. And all we want to do is make more sheep. We want a bigger flock. We want a bigger flock because we know we have the only shepherd that matters. The good shepherd that lays his life down for those sheep. So Jesus, we're asking this morning that this week you would, you would use us as we walk out into our work, into our, our daily lives, as we live, as we go to doctor's appointments and to, 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 to get groceries and those things. That you would help us to see everybody that is around us that needs you, that we could be a witness to those people. Maybe there's something that we can do or say that can let them see the love of the good shepherd. And for those that are walking away, I'm asking that they would just listen, just listen for your call. To come back to the fold. And when they do, Jesus, we will give you praise and we will give you glory. And we will welcome them in. Because we too were once lost, and now we are found. Blind at one time, but now we see. Jesus, we love you today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.